Well, we have to remember that water vapor is a condensable greenhouse gas. It has a residence time in the atmosphere of a couple of weeks. It forms clouds, precipitation, the whole hydrological cycle that we all know since primary school. So the effect of a punctual event like that might not be that long lived because the atmosphere will re-equilibrate. But it is, you know, we, we, it will have an effect and, and um, water vapor in the atmosphere also driven by other processes, not just volcanism, but irrigation. You know, we've had vast changes to our irrigation systems over the past uh, decades. Taming of rivers. The Colorado River barely flows at all into the Gulf of Mexico, or the uh, uh, Gulf of uh, California anymore because it's all used for irrigation. Well, where is that water going? It's going into the atmosphere in areas where previously we didn't have that density of water vapor in the atmosphere. Not very well constrained, not very well quantified, but surely a component of um, climate, mm -hmm. at least local and regional climate. Because this is economics, this is your pocketbook. This is, this is where your money is gonna go as a taxpayer. And, and not only the, the financial consequences, the environmental consequences. Right now we're using energy sources which are, uh, I won't say they're benign, but you know, we've had impact on the planet. But if we want to convert our energy sources to green energy sources, and when people think green, they're thinking wind and solar and hydro. And it just can't be done. But in trying to do so, we're going to have huge environmental consequences. The environmental impact of a, of a wind farm is far more, you know, we see these towers and the blades turning, you know, uh, bucolically in the air and it all looks very pristine and aren't we in harmony with nature and the wind and all the rest, but the environmental damage that goes into building that one turbine, which is only going to last 10 years or so, then they have to, who knows how, recycle those blades out of carbon and, and, and everything else. And the concrete base that it's built on, are, there's huge environmental consequences to producing that cement, the CO2 emissions associated with that. So this is, um, and the cost, people have to know about this. And the reality check that, that I want to present is that it can't be done with these green energies. Well, I'm naysaying, <laughs> correct, but I like to also think that I'm a soothsayer. <laughs> I'm speaking the truth, and I'm not the first person to say these things, but uh, I've been thinking about these things for the past decade, and, uh, and you know these thoughts start to gel. And if people will listen, I'm glad to talk about what I see. And, and these are easy calculations to make. It doesn't cost a, a lot of intellectual uh, energy to figure out what it's going to take to convert our combustion of oil and gas, which is not just for producing electricity today. It's to heat our homes. It's to run our industries. It's to produce cement and steel, which we need for all these green energies to uh, deploy them. And, uh, you know, to, to run the numbers, it's pretty simple math. It's a lot of conversion. How on earth are we going to do it? The transmission lines that we have to put out to very remote regions for all these new wind farms that we want to build. Where on earth are we going to find the untamed rivers to put on dams to flood you know, thousands of square kilometers of terrain, which hmm, might be somebody who's using that land for something, whether it's for hunting or farming or, or something, there's going to be land claims. So the, the, re, the reality check is that these are high in the sky, or pie in the sky hopes. It ain't going to happen. So uh, rough calculation, full disclo disclosure, uh, but I looked at the area to be flooded by Site C in uh, northern BC. 
uh, which is a 1.1 gigawatt uh, supply, we need about 80 site Cs to achieve just the hydro portion of the net zero strategy. And so uh, I, I multiplied that out and you get about 8,000 square kilometers, which is a swath of land across Canada, a kilometer wide that we'd be flooding. So it's all your real estate now. Well, I think that's very clear. Ideal, f and, and I'm not uh, inventing any new insights here, but hydro, to be useful, wants to be uh, a lot of generation capacity, Niagara Falls, for example, and close to our, where we're using it. So places like Niagara Falls, um, and uh, you know, th then you get into more re remote areas like uh, the... Um, Northern Quebec uh, dams, the uh, Grand Belen, uh, and uh, and those more remote, so it cost terrific amounts of money to string out the transmission uh, lines to to bring that power to the to the centers. So yes, all the the good sites are taken. <laughs> Absolutely. When you look at the um, footprint per terawatt hour of electricity production, hydro is one of the worst. It requires vast footprint and far more than even coal. And coal, you have big terrains that you're mining coal, but a coal plant is very small. I'm not promoting coal. All I'm saying is that comparatively speaking, hydro has a big footprint and someone's going to give up their land for that. Thank you.